of Dora. Welcome to Torah Talk, a Torah Institute podcast. Torah just means instruction in Hebrew. At Torah Talk, we will make straight the ways of Yahuwah and discuss the simple truths of Scripture so that even you can understand and get all the juicy life hidden within the pages of Yahuwah's Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. <laughs> Oh, hey, here we go. Okay, there. Let there be picture. That's exactly right. That was the lovely Mrs. White, and she yes. helped us. Your computer tech. That's right. <laughs> okay. Good morning, brother, sister. Good morning. Good morning, sister and brother. <laughs> yeah, she's getting me another cup of coffee. She's so nice. She's a morning person. Are you a morning person? Uh, not really. My family have always been night owls. They like, can stay up till all hours of the night. And, yeah. But, uh, with yeah. young young children, I'm kind of being trained out of that, which is good. Well, yes. Uh, yeah. I have to admit, I tend towards the nighttime. Uh, I can stay up, up late, but I don't, of course, because I'm not allowed to. Yeah. But uh, in the morning, uh, the first one to ri rise me up is my wife. She's going, come on. Yeah. You know, it's just such a time. She loves the morning. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. So anyway, what are we uh, thinking about today? Well, after the, oh. last, after the last few emails uh, from yesterday or today about the, the trolls and things and the often it's easy to get distracted on many tangents. I thought, well, maybe I've been trying to control these things a bit too much, so I think we'll just flow. What's been Oh, you mean, you mean on the Torah Institute YouTube there were a lot of trolls? Yeah, I put a comment up about 10 minutes ago because I've gone through all the, the videos over the last day and taken off all the hideous comments. Um, anything that's not... Anything that's not positive or yeah nice, I've taken them all off. I thought people don't need to be exposed to all that. Um, um, yeah, whatever is uplifting. You know, Philippians chapter four. Yeah, that's we don't need to have people that are attacking either the 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 teaching of of the scripture. I mean, we're not teaching anything different from scripture. It's just that uh, no. people have their own uh, private interpretations. Mm. You read the word and you take it straight forward. You know it, it is what it is, and you have to conform to it. And a lot of people don't want to. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what it is. I guess people have found us uh, on the YouTube and they're, you know, excitedly attacking. You know, because they <laughs> they can do it anonymously. They can just make up a name. Yeah. You know. Well, I put a little bit of a a comment on our homepage about 10 minutes ago saying that uh, we don't tolerate Torophobic trolls anymore. So, yeah. <laughs> so if you've got nothing nice to say, don't say anything. You know, I, I noticed that in the videos, people can hardly understand what we're saying to each other whenever we're both making some sort of a sound or uh, talking together. Mm. You know, it clips out. Yes. So I'm learning to shut up. <laughs> well, I need to do the same. Yeah, I, whenever you're speaking, I'll quiet down and not make any noises or, you know, whatever. Okay. So uh, what's been on your heart this week, brother? You know, yesterday morning, <clears throat> it was just a few days, really, after the last seminar, and I'm uh, waiting for Yahusha to tell me what the next subject that I need to teach on is, and I have to learn too. I learn first, and then what he teaches from Scripture, and then I just basically show people what it is. People say, well, how do you do that? And I go, well, I don't know. I just wait and listen. And I'm waiting, 
And then I was brushing my teeth and yesterday morning and it suddenly hit me. <laughs> the next seminar is death, the final enemy. And uh, wow, or the last enemy, you know. You gonna or, hold a pitchfork? Are you gonna hold a, uh, a reaper? Uh, maybe a trident. <laughs> uh, uh oh, I don't think so. I, I don't know if I'm gonna hold one of those, but I might be able to find some good photographs of people doing that. But uh, yeah, death is uh, something that I've all my life I've just said, what is that? That's just not right. And uh, it isn't. It really isn't. It's not logical. It's not something that you who had planned. You know, it, it's something that he made an allowance for, though, for rebellion. And, uh, you know, it's been going on since the beginning. And people have been absolutely traumatized by it and fearful of it. And, um, you know, because there seems to be a closing off of something and the, the body is decaying. The second law of thermodynamics, which is thermo, means temperature or heat. So we've got a heat thing going on. The, the reason the stars shine, the reason the sun shines is the, uh, a thermodynamic process. But uh, in other areas, this thermodynamic activity is in the second law of thermodynamics. It creates a, you know, a situation that's conducive to destruction and chaos, and it causes the ultimate death of whatever is alive. You know, the physiological breaking down of the parts. And it's, uh, it's like we have a, a, even if nothing harmful happens to us, bacteriologically, virally, or, or physically, we still have a time clock ticking down in, in our each, each, each one of our cells. You know, at the DNA strand, there's at the either end, there's these platforms that the, the, the cell begins, it unlocks and and it, and it uses it for a pl platform to build upon and reproduce itself. So it kind of unzips. And every time it unzips, it loses one telomere, which is a, I mentioned in my book, Fossilized Customs. It's a, uh, and, it, every, and you only have so many telomeres, and each time your cell divides or unzips and reproduces itself, it loses a telomere. And then the next time, and then when you run out of telomeres, eh, it's over, <laughs> you know. Oh, you're dead. <laughs> yeah, you're dead. Yes. So, uh, you know, and I've observed family members, uh, no one close, thankfully, but people that were aunts and uh, uncles and so forth, and my grandparents, they're all now dead. And, of course, I don't, I mean, we all wonder, where are they, you know? They're not under the sun. They're not able to know anything that's going on under the sun, but uh, they're somewhere, you know, and they're sleeping is what we understand now from Yahushua's explanation. Mm. Wow. Is that your next seminar? You who are willing. Yeah, that's uh, that's going to be an amazing study. Yeah. I can already find, think of some tunes. <laughs> What, like, don't fear the reaper? Uh, <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, Edgar Allan Poe uh, wrote The Raven and The Telltale Heart. And, uh, of course, death has been a theme in a lot of the movies and, and poems. And, you know, the grief that people have to go through. Psalm 23, the valley of death, the valley of the shadow of death. Um you know, choose life, don't choose death, and the Torah phobia is going to lead to death, you know. So you're going to be dealing with uh, just merely physical death or the issue of the afterlife? Well, I'm going to have to wait and see what he says, but I mean, what he guides me to, but yeah, the afterlife is a second death. There's a first death and a second death, and of course the second death is what we all hope uh, you know, we would like to see the first death not happen, but it looks uh, like every single person is uh, prearranged for that unless he comes back while they're yet alive. And then if uh, the second death occurs, it's, it's because of their decision, not his. It's, it's, we send ourselves 
into total destruction in the lake of fire, and we have eternal death, you know, whatever that is. And a lot of, I mean, I lean towards the idea that, you know, of course, it's uh, utter, utter laying waste, it's destruction, it's not eternal life. Eternal life in order to die for, forever? Well, that's eternal life. But eternal death would be, where is he? He's gone. He's eternally dead. You know, no more. There is no more coming back. No more third chance. You know, or whatever you want to call it. But uh, uh, that's just where I lean. Now, if he wants to punish people forever and ever and ever in darkness and flames, um, that's not the heart of the one that that resides uh, inside me. But you know, he's not a tormentor. He's not. He has no evil. He's only set apart. So you know, those are all issues we can get in arguments about. But you know, in, in the uh, grand scheme of things, uh, he, he's above us, far above us. We, he's unknowable, really, in in his fullness. But the the little bit that we do know about Yahuwah, it, it, you know, that, that we can comprehend and experience, uh, he's loving and forgiving and merciful, and he's uh, not a tormentor. He's nothing like us. You know, vengeance is his. And he will probably have different levels of methods of extermination because some people have been just incredibly evil. And, of course, uh, that's up to him, though. You know. We wouldn't want to be the judge, and we don't want to name people that he may have already forgiven. You know, we don't even know. The one that's been forgiven much loves much. And that's one of the things that's going to be pretty shocking to people when they're in the kingdom, the, the world to come, the earth, it's going to be re recreated. When they see certain individuals, they're going to go, I can't believe that you made you made it here. And you've been misspelling his name and teaching people the wrong spelling. And uh, you know, that's, I'm using that as a, a silly example. Uh, but uh, oh, being overly critical and and so forth is uh, getting nowhere. I, I was just thinking, you know, when we read about it in Scripture, we need more teamwork in order to get his mission accomplished, not ours. And teamwork is unity. It's working together as a group to accomplish a goal. And if his head, he's the head, is controlling his body, then we would all be doing something that's in the same direction together. Instead of uh, some of us pulling in the other direction and going, no, you're going the wrong way. Um, I don't like the I don't like you because you have a, a misinterpretation of uh, you know this or that. Um, you know, I, I accept a lot of things that people, other people, do do that, and I, I accept them, and I but I just don't see the maybe the technical thing to where I teach it, but. I, I still love them and I pray for them every day, the, the ones that are the most ferocious. But uh, I, I wish that we could get together and have more teamwork, you know. The workers in the harvest are very few. We need more help, don't we? It, absolutely. Mm. Do you think there'll be different levels of um, reward? We've always understood that there'd be different levels of reward in the... Uh, in the new kingdom, something about there was a scripture about uh, uh, multitudes who sleep will be risen up. There'll be different. I think you wrote something about there were different levels of brightness or something like that. Like the stars in the heavens are different. Some will shine brighter than others. Yeah, Daniel. Uh, Daniel yeah. talks. Of, well, yeah. The uh, is it? I think it's chapter uh, twelve. I'm not sure, but it think, seems like. Do you think some will inherit mansions and some will inherit the, you know, the, the basement? <laughs> you know, that's another thing. We 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 think of uh, the physical things uh, in this world as riches. In the in the world to come, it's not going to be that way. More than likely, it's going to be more like gifts, powers, um, things that we can manage to accomplish with his spirit in us 
to do things at other levels maybe wouldn't have the abilities that others would have, like uh, the superpowers, if you want to call it that. Wow. X-ray vision or whatever. <laughs> you know. But, you know, those are those are things that we don't know anything about yet, but those that's all in his department. But uh, I would expect that, that it would be a matter of, you know, the, the suit that we're going to be in is going to have a little bit more of the uh, extra features, you know, like if you buy a, a vehicle today and you you get the power windows and you've got the, uh, you know, the things on the dashboard and control systems that maybe a, a non-luxury wouldn't have, you know. Uh, so it might be something more like that, but, you know, it's not going to be a, a vehicle, of course. It's going to be our new eternal body, uh, you know. I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but do you consider that all the planets that are out there might have a purpose? I mean, they, they obviously have a purpose now. They're stunning. But the, do you think um, there's a reason they're all there? Do you think that he might do something with them? Yes, I think there's a huge plan that's going to unfold, and it's going to be an amazing thing. When we go back and he repairs everything to, you know, and removes the curse that he placed on things, that, uh, you know, my th personal theory is that light itself throughout the universe was instantaneous. It wasn't traveling at 300,000 kilometers per second and, or 186, 282, you know, per, sec per miles per second. It was. It was instantaneous, you know, that would, light would be there, you know. But uh, that would be, that also contributes to our tendency to misunderstand the age of the universe because we say, well, light's going this fast and that thing is that far away. So it took this many years to get here. So these young earthers are idiots. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, the interpretation of the facts can be misleading uh, because light itself is actually slowing down even now. They've proven that. It's still mm -hmm. slowing down. Now, the rate that was slowing down earlier, you know, might have been much, much faster, you know, and now it's still kind of fading away, you know, and they're finding that, uh, you know, the universe is increasing in its expansion, which is maybe an interpretation of something else. Maybe if they say, well, these things are expanding faster and faster and faster. But it might be that something else is going on, you know. But uh, I don't know. I, we, we really don't know a lot. We just, all we can do is just guess. But uh, well, it was wonderful what you said in that email yesterday. Uh, it's not for us to always know the answers, but we know the one who does know all the answers. And knowing him is the greatest thing. That's the, that's the key. And, you know, people say, well, you know, why don't you know? And uh, it's, it's a matter of uh, knowing the one that does know everything. We don't know everything. We're children, you know. Even if we're uh, 5,000 years old or a million years old to him, we're children. You know, he's the one that is all-knowing, all-powerful. He, he resides outside time itself. And he sees the future because he's not in a timeline. He's outside that, but he did step into time and, and took on uh, the appearance of, of a sinful person, you know, being in the image of man. And then, uh, you know, we're all blessed because of it. You know, it's not, it's the people that reject Yahusha are in for a world of, of hurt and the, they're in their present lives and in the future. They need to just say, well, I acknowledge that I don't know everything and I'm not wanting to be in control. Because even though we struggle thinking we're in control of uh, our environment, we get really angry when something even small happens. And it's because we're out of control. We're, uh, we're out of not only control of ourselves, but we're not in control of our environment. But you see, uh, you know... <clears throat> Demonic activity, uh, other people's uh, accidental behavior uh, can sometimes send us off into a rage, and it's and it's because we become frightened, 
and the and the emotion of fear creates the next level of uh, you know it's either flight or fight, and the and if we're not fleeing, then we're going to fight, so we get angry, and our anger is the reason is caused by our our fear uh, because we're not in control, mm. you know. Right. That's amazing. What's the deal uh, with this praying for the uh, the dead, praying for dead people, praying for Adam and Kuwar? And oh, Pesha yeah. Pesha and I understand the concept of time travel. I understand that. Yeah. But uh, do you think it makes a difference or do you just do it because out of love? That's the only reason. It's because of my concern and the concern was put inside me by him. It's not my uh, personal idea. It's his idea. But uh, praying for the saints or praying for the Kodeshim, that means the set-apart ones, if we pray for one another and that whether it helps right then or not, it doesn't matter. And uh, if we pray for our children, and of course we can pray for their future spouses and their children, and we can pray for other people and their children, you know, and it doesn't matter whether you're in Australia or whether you're in, here on the other side of the earth, uh, prayer helps. And it's some of the most powerful thing, uh, things that we can do. And it's not because we're doing it. It's because Yahusha is impelling us to do something, and it's according to his will. So when we acknowledge his will, then, you know, it changes us. And that's, uh, that's the key. But uh, when, if I, for example, and some people are probably thinking I'm really way out there for praying for the first man and woman and their family and praying for uh, Enoch or Hanach and uh, Methuselah and Noah, and his family, and the, his three sons and their wives, to pray for the beings that were on that boat, for that, that huge thing that <laughs> he had to build. Well, uh, to pray for Abraham, uh, Abraham, uh, Ishak, and Yaakov, and to pray for our beloved brother Paul, and all of Yahushua's Nazarene and his disciples. You know, they're, they're dead. They're sleeping. But when I pray for them, I'm praying for them while they're alive, because I'm praying to the one that is timeless. And in in my time, in the future, from their perspective, I'm praying to, I'm not praying to them. See, the Catholic uh, thing that I was in, we were praying to dead saints and asking for their help. And that intercession was all part of a mind programming thing. And we're not supposed to pray to dead people, you know. Uh, I think it's Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter 8, you know, he asked the question, should we be praying to the dead for the sake of the living? <laughs> you know, and he says, uh, you know, I'm the one, I'm the sovereign, talk to me. Anyway, when we talk to him, then we're praying to someone that can get something done, you know, and who knows what because someone prayed for someone, you know, uh, what, what, was, what, what was accomplished for it, you know. But uh, mm. I'm not saying that time is going to change, but it, he's capable of anything, so, you know. When we were uh, in Christianity, we read all these thick books about intercessory prayer, and a few of them said that uh, they were taking scriptures from Revelation where the uh, messengers were emptying the bowls of the saints or go and grab the bowl that's full of the prayers of the saints or something like that. And that led them to conclude that uh, we need, if we actually want to see something happen, happen, we need to pray and pray and pray and pray and pray until our bowl is filled up. Then what we're praying for will be accomplished. Does that seem a bit strange to you? Yes, it sounds like... Uh some sort of a wish to a genie. Yeah. You, uh, when I pray, I try to not impose my will into the environment of my prayer, but rather listen for his will and pray for those that he leads me to pray for. He puts people in my head, uh, the, the names of people, and I pray for them. Sometimes I'll be praying for someone spontaneously, and then I'll hear later that 
they had a serious problem, you know. At the same time, I was praying for them. You know, it's because, you know, we've got a hive mind. You know, have Speak you ever heard yourself. of... Hey, have you ever heard of the, uh, Star, the Star Trek, uh, yeah. you know, who, what were they, the invaders called? Uh, it's early in the morning, forgive me. Uh, the Some invasion, invading uh, entities were coming and Romulans, they were coming. was it? Who was it? Was it Romulans? Not the Romulans, no. Mm. Oh, well, everybody knows. I mean, it's a Trekkie. And I know, too, but it's, you know, anyway, these are... Uh, transhuman beings and they've got part machine in them and they've got this giant cube you know that's where their base is it's a it's their spaceship it's a huge ugly looking blob the borg it's a, the borg that's it yeah yeah oh, that's what they called is it yeah the borg oh, okay anyway it sounds sort of like a really evil romanian family or something <laughs> anyway the yeah. The hive mind, you know, the uh, idea that they're all interconnected mentally is uh, something that's true of us, too, because we have the mind of Messiah. You know, we all share that. Yeah. And his mind can tell all of us the same thing at the same time. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Lou White does not have a problem with Romanians, okay? Uh, no, I don't have Romanians. The Romanians are awesome. Yeah. In fact, uh, I was invited to go to Romania at one point a few years ago, mm. but you know, because of the obligations I have here, I can't really do much traveling. I'd love to be able to travel. Uh, I'm not a traveler. I, you know, I tend to get constipated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just not. Yeah. And uh, the food, I can't. You know, the foods are changing all the time. And, yeah. But uh, well, it's not. Welcome to Tour Talk, brothers and sisters. Today we're talking about poo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talking about dead people, uh, do you have Anzac Day over there? Do you celebrate Anzacs, the people that fought the wars? for? The... In Australia we have Anzac Day. It celebrates all the diggers, all the men and women or men that went out to the World War I and World War II. It's called Anzac Day. Do you have that over there? Not by that name. We have Veterans Day and, yeah. you know, you know, people that have fought in the wars and uh, they pay their respects. And, they, they, and shut, uh, they shut roads off and march down the street and wear all their medals and they have sunrise services. And Yeah, yeah, they, uh, they do the same sort of thing right here. Uh, they don't necessarily, well, they have parades, yeah, and uh, downtown. Of course, I haven't ever been to one of those, but uh, I, w I served in the military myself in the uh, United States Air Force. And a couple of those years I spent in the Orient uh, around Japan, you know, and uh, Okinawa. And uh, for a, a few, I uh, made a few visits to Korea. And I absolutely was, you know, in, uh, amazed by the Orientals. They're amazing people. They're, they're kind and gentle spirits, and it's really, uh, the more I, uh, well, it took me probably a few decades until I got to be in my 40s that I realized that the people of the, of the world, they may look different, but they're all very, very precious people. It's the governments that are so ugly. It's like they're all thugs. You know, they're all, they're all like uh, gangs, and they get in control of their individual populations and 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 then you hear about the way they they treat people and you go that is so sad and you think and a lot of people probably mostly think that well those people are all like that and you know and they're not it's just that you hear about governments and the united states i understand that in in the view of the of the eye of the people of the world it, you know is a pretty ugly place but the people here are really not like that, you know. And it's the same way of, uh, wherever you go. Mm -hmm. If you went to Iran, Iran is like, ooh, you know, uh, this really scary place. It has a wonderful history. Uh, if you go back, you know, a, a thousand years and, be, and beyond that, three thousand years, 
and there's some pretty amazing things, but they, they were the enemies of Israel, you know, the people that were in that area, you know, the Assyrians, and Persians, and people like that, you know, that took Israel captive. Uh, but the people there today, um, they're, they're, I mean, the people that, that were doing even that, that was not necessarily the everyday person. That was the government in charge, you know. And uh, that's, you know, why I think Yonah, Yonah, the, or they call Jonah, was sent to Nineveh. Nineveh was a great city, and it was the capital city of the enemy of Israel. But Yonah was sent there as a prophet of Israel to, to teach them to repent so that Yahuwah wouldn't destroy the city, because the city was marked for destruction. And uh, that would have been a good thing in terms of uh, Israel's outcome. And that's why Yonah didn't want to obey. He said, I'm out of here. I'm going to let you destroy that place. And I'll die instead. And it was a self-sacrifice thing for Yonah. But, uh, you know, the people, though, were probably precious in Yahuwah's sight. You know, in fact, he was telling Yonah, uh, there's all these young people that don't know their left hand from their right hand. And, you know, they're not guilty, you know. And uh, it was just a, you know, the, the power structure, you know, that we tend to become, you know, distracted by. Yeah. So would you consider um, Veterans Day or Anzac Day or those sort of things to be worshipping or celebrating the dead in a, in a pagan sense? Well, they're not doing the same thing as Halloween does, all Hallowoods even because that would be something that was an adaptation from a pagan thing. But I, I don't think that the way we do it here for Veterans Day is anything like that. It's just a, an annual recognition of uh, paying respect for those that, that gave everything that they had in service to their country for the benefit of those that are still alive and their families and friends and neighbors and their nation. But uh, the individual act of their service where they actually perished, uh, that's up to you who had to judge that. You know, soldiers do their, do their terrible deeds for a purpose. And, you know, it, it, wars are always going to be here until Yahushua returns. So we have to, you know, deal with that and it would be nice if we didn't need police or locks on doors and but thieving and, and murdering and raping and you know lawlessness is really the result of the heart of men not turning over their will to Yahuwah and accepting his instructions you know his Torah mm -hmm. so being Torah phobic is causing all these problems and uh, that's the reason death is in the world now you know the next seminar topic you know, what about uh, sunrise services? Is that pagan, or is it just at uh, the bunny rabbit time when it's pagan? Yeah, any time you go to watch the sun and face the sun, and the as it rises, your activity is reflecting the same thing that was recorded in the book of uh, Yehezkel or Ezekiel, chapter eight. And that is an abomination. It's identified as an abomination. And uh, people don't realize what they're doing when they follow their pastor to some hill and they face the sun. You know, I don't know if you can tell or not, but the sun's starting to come up really nicely here. And uh, it's uh, shading. I mean, it's shining on this side of me. Mm. Just a little bit. Can you tell? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. You were starting to get a bit red last week and burn, burning in the sun in Egypt when we were there. That might have been it, yes, because uh, I don't do well, you know, with a lot of sunshine. Mm. A little bit is good, but uh, if, if I get too much, it's not good. Yeah, yeah. Ah. <laughs> I wonder where we are right now. I mean, uh, oh, I'm looking. Uh, get some lighthouses or anything you could put in there? Yeah, that's a lovely lighthouse you've got uh, behind you. Stunning. Mm. I've always liked them. I don't know why. It's just something that, uh, you know, lighthouses are 
you know, basically things that are just mis mysterious objects, but they're not pagan, you know. The lighthouse at Alexandria might have been a little pagan, but, uh, you know, I don't think that the, a lighthouse is, because uh, it is a functioning item to get the light out there so the ships won't hit the rocks, you know. And it's mostly for stormy days, foggy days, things like that. So we've got uh, Yom, Yom uh, Kafar coming up uh, tomorrow yeah. night, tomorrow night for us. Yeah, we've been doing it for, I don't even know how many years now, but uh, 20, or 20 something, 24, 20, yeah, 24, 25 years at least. And every year we look forward, I look forward to it. I, in years past, I used to dread it. I used to go, oh, no, I remember the pain from last year. And um, I look forward to it now. I've, I, for the last few years, I've been going, oh, boy, I, I get to fast for a whole day. Uh, and it, it, it is a fast. A lot of people say it doesn't mean fast to afflict your nefesh, to afflict your being. A lot of people say, no, it, is, it isn't about, you know, abstaining from food or anything. It it just means you're supposed to be sad or reflect. Just turn, just turn the telly off. <laughs> well, I'm certainly going to do that. Uh, I'm going to give up a lot more than food. But here's the thing. Uh, the idea of it being a fast is, is mentioned in the book of Acts. Because if you read, if you just go to your concordance and you look up the word fast, in the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 28. I don't have that right here, but uh, I could look it up real quick for us. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Anyway, the it says the fast was passed. If I could find the scripture, I'm going to read that text to you. And those of us that might want to say, no, it's... What was the chapter? I got one here. I think it's chapter 28, uh, but I'm not sure or something. That's the last chapter. You find it. You know what you're looking for. Yeah, let's look. You're going to have to tell us all the things you're planning on giving up on this day now. You got us curious. <laughs> well, I'm certainly going to give up. I'm certainly going to be giving up coffee, and I'm going to give up. Uh, any, I'm going to. I'll probably drink a little water, but that's only because of the fact that. We, do, we are mostly water, and we have to replace the water, but don't overdo it. Just sip water. But uh, I'm not going to have any food. Now, it says uh, there's a, the captain, have, starting in Acts 27, verse 6, and there the captain, having found an Alexandrian ship, which is, of course, in Egypt, sailing to Italy, did put us on board. And having sailed slowly many days and arriving with difficulty off Nidos, the wind not allowing us to proceed, we sailed close to Crete off Salmoni. And passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. Now this is the verse. It's, it's verse 9 in chapter 27. And much time having passed, and the sailing now being dangerous, because the fast was already over, Shaul advised them, saying, Men, I see that this voyage is going to end with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. So anyway, we're just looking at that section there. They're sailing in. So it's referring to a real fast. The fast, yeah. And it's only the fast. It's not any fast. It's the fast. There's texts where they say uh, they fast twice a week. The the Pharisees are going, aren't we great? We we fast twice a week. And of course, that's a Talmudic, uh, you know, tradition of men that they did fast. And it's okay to designate a fast for yourself if you're wanting to pray and you want to seek His will. 
not to bend his will, but to seek his will and bend yours. <laughs> you know, that's really what prayer is about. Yeah. And, uh, but that's the relationship too. I mean, you have a relationship with Yahusha because you're praying, and uh, that's good. If you don't talk, if you don't talk to him, I mean, what kind of relationship is that? You know. Because we should be watching and listening and, you know, if I hadn't have been watch, watching and listening while I was brushing my teeth, I wouldn't know what the next seminar was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, what is it about this feast, uh, like uh, the Day of Atonement? Um, tell everybody what happened on the Day of Atonement when Moshe first instituted it. Well, that would be something that um, you may have read more about it than I have. I've only read about it uh, a little bit. In studying that, it's a priestly duty for the high priest to go into the Kodash and uh, the and on the Day of Atonement, having offered uh, sacrifice for his own sins and the sins of, his, of, of the whole nation of Israel, and he would sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat, or the, the, the side of the uh, mercy seat. And uh, that would atone for the sins of the whole nation. And of course, in doing so, it was a pre-shadow or a shadow picture of what Yahushua himself would do one day as one sacrifice forever, for one sacrifice for all. And not any more need for that, you know. And that was really the culmination of the uh, of all the sacrifices. It was they were all basically leading up to this moment in time. And uh, so the day of uh, Yom uh, Yom Kafar is what it's really called. Is the day of the covering, and I understand that to be the day that we're. Uh, looking forward to when we're covered with our immortality, you know, when we receive our immortality. And this other thing that we're in, this body of sin and death, no longer even exists. Hmm. And the blood of Messiah is sprinkled upon our hearts now, but the blood of Messiah, because it's there, we're going to be given this new new tent, you know, our new home, our new home. Now, when we think of buildings, that was what we were, uh, a lot of times we're thinking when, when a Christian says, I'm going to the, to the C-H-U-R-C-H. <laughs> well, we are the assembly, you know. When, when, uh, when we read the word synagogue in the scriptures, we're not talking about a room or a building. We're talking about the congregation, you know. In the Hebrew, it's Knesset, or Knesset. Knesset, Knesset is one of the things that um, is referred to mostly. I mean, that's the most common term, but it means the group or the con congregation. And it's really sp speaking in that sense of a local congregation, but it's talking about the people themselves, not a, a building. I mean, if you um, showed up at your uh, study you know, and there was no building at all, you'd say, well, that's not a problem. Uh, we'll just sit here by this uh, little happy little creek here, and we'll have our synagogue there. We'll study sit, there. Sit by the lighthouse. Sit by the lighthouse, have a nice, uh, you know, a little uh, coffee or tea, and uh, sit and chat about the Torah, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Day of Atonement, though, is coming I out. To, and, I have to stop you. You've, you've gone all out of focus. Oh, I'm out of focus. Totally. Your camera, your camera has just got fed up with you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, there you're back now. You're back. Okay. Yeah. It found you. Okay. It found you. There you go. So how does Is the... There... Yeah, that's great, mate. Yeah. Um, how does the Day of Atonement tie in with us fasting? What is it that we should be... I think I asked you this a couple of weeks ago. What is it that we should be coming up to the, the feast day? We don't want it to be an empty religious exercise where we're just fasting because we're commanded to. What are we supposed to be thinking about? I know it's obviously Yahushua, but what, uh, 
Day of Atonement and fasting. Where's the connection? Well, the uh, way that, in, in my experience, having done it many times, I'm focusing on my flesh. I'm, and I'm basically perceiving the war. The war that is battle, the battle between my spirit and my flesh. And it's only a small glimpse because it's one day is, is like nothing, you know, to, but you know, you could reach out and take a piece of fruit, but you don't. And you, it's because your spirit is saying that's not permitted uh, today. And so you're, you're really feeling that and that overcoming that flesh, which is normally in charge of us, you know, our flesh tells us what it wants and then we just go along for the ride. But that one day we have to be in charge and it really makes it uh, important to understand that trying to keep food away from someone else is not helping them. You, you see, we have to instill in them year by year by year as our children grow up, the will that has to be instilled in them. In, in them. Our will can't be imposed on them to control them. We have to explain to them that they have a, a component inside them that's the real them, and they must take charge over their flesh and say, this far and no farther, and that's it. And that's the real battle. And that's what I've learned from it. And in doing so, it leads us toward our decision when we actually turn our will over, that will that we're using inside ourselves, to let him control it, let Yahusha take charge of us and turn it over to him. And at that point is when we have over, we enable ourselves to have become real overcomers. Over, we have all the power over the enemy at that point. And that's uh, really, I guess, that's the shadow that young Kafar actually is showing us, is that uh, the enemy is going to be overcome at some point. And that day is obviously an important point where that uh, manifests itself, or it will manifest itself when he's locked up, when, he's a, when you, the adversary is arrested. So we have to kind of arrest ourselves and, and, and in a small way and keep ourselves from doing what we would like to do. And I'll tell you what, by uh, 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Yom Kafar, when you're still three or so, three and a half hours away from being able to eat anything, that's where the rubber really meets, hits the road. That's the point where you really have to be aiming for and say, well, that's, I mean, because you can make it to 1 o'clock, to two o'clock, but from that point on, that's when the real heat comes pouring on, and that's uh, that's what I look forward to. I'm going. I can make it. You're not going to die, you know. But it, you know, if you become woozy or ill, or you start getting cramps, then you should take a little water in small sips, and that's that's okay, you know, because you don't want to lose your blood pressure. It's not supposed to be that kind of suffering. You mentioned you'd be uh, uh, giving up more than food. He didn't answer me. What else are you giving up? I, I said, turn the telly off. He said, yeah, you'll be doing that. So what would you yep. be doing? Just we read. won't be reading scripture, uh, resting, and you can take naps, you know, which is what I normally do. And Phyllis always accuses me of um, escaping that way. But, you know, you can slow your metabolism down, too, and, you know, and, and that's what I do. And I do. It, it is a Sabbath of Sabbaths, and the word Sabbath does imply ceasing. So if you shut your whole body down, yeah. then you know, that's ceasing. <laughs> that's you know, cheating. You're not, yeah, you're not going out cutting the grass and yeah. uh, working in the garden, you know, and uh Doing anything that is an activity that you're, you have to turn your foot from doing your will on that day. Hmm. And turn your, actually, you should be fighting the, you know, I've been distracted sometimes 
getting involved in a project, as I'm sure you really do, because and you have to do you know a project for long hours, and you have to see it through to its completion, and you'll lose sleep, and you won't drink, and you won't eat, and you, because you're not thinking about it, you know. But you know when Moshe was in the presence of Yahuwah on the mountain. He didn't eat or drink for 40 days and 40 nights because he was in the presence of life-sustaining forces and the energy of Yahuwah, you know, was empowering him. He had no need of food, you know. I'm always getting in trouble for that. <laughs> <laughs> My wife tells me, you didn't eat the food I gave you. I said, I was just lost in, in, in you know, yes. what I was doing, you know. Yeah, there would be a sandwich that's gone bad or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's because of your uh, overarching um, focus on what you're really doing. Yeah. You know, yeah, it gives you more um, pleasure what you're doing, the what you're receiving, what you're sort yeah. of getting. It's what your mind's on, you know. And if your mind is fixed on Yahuwah and Yahusha, His His uh, Spirit in in you, and listening to Him. Asking him for stuff for you isn't what his goal is. It's about, you know, him operating through you and be, you submitting your will to him and saying, well, what, how is it you want to use, me? you know, what, what good thing would you want me to do for you? How can I serve you? Uh, now, if we find ourselves going out and going, I think I'm supposed to attack these other people, you know, <laughs> either verbally or physically, then you might not be listening to the right spirit, you know, mm. you know that like the trolls. Yeah. Uh, I never have been able to wrap my brain around that because I'm not, I don't want to attack them, you know, no. even though I might be a victim, uh, you know, I just want to just see the, the best thing for them, you know. Well, every time I start getting offended or getting my back up at things, my mate always tells me, you're supposed to be rejoicing. When you're persecuted, you're supposed to rejoice. That's true. Yeah. That is true. Because we're sharing in the sufferings of the Messiah in a small way. Yeah. And if they persecuted him, then they will persecute you also. Mm. You know, as he, as he said, they, if they persecuted me, it, you know, then they'll, they'll, they'll do the same to you. So that's our expectation, you know. Mm. <clears throat> and it is a thing to rejoice about because mm. that means that, well, when the 70... He sent 70 men out to do all sorts of things. And when they came back, they, they were just going, I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and, the, and these amazing things happened. Healings, demonic possessions, uh, all these things were just eradicated in your name. And uh, he said, well, you might be happy about that and rejoice about that, but here's the thing you need to rejoice about. Your name is written in the scroll of life. Whoa, <laughs> that's an amazing thing to even just think about it, that that would, that would be possible yeah. to know that, you know. But we have that, that assurance, you know, that that is the fact. And, uh, you know, when you're seeing things, uh, when you see people that say, I love the Torah, and, and their activities show that, and they're teaching the Torah, then, and that rubs off on others, and then they start teaching the Torah, uh, we know that we're on the same team together. We're under the same head, you know. The, the theme of overcoming is right through Scripture, isn't it? So this feast is really uh, symbolizing that, isn't it? Overcoming and o overcoming a day with no food is sort of is not really anything compared to the lusts of the flesh that we are, we've all chosen to give up, you know. Yes, exactly, yeah. Uh, we're not going to have any desserts. We're not going to have any meals. We're just going to do without. But it's, uh, it's a little different from fasting for the purpose of uh, helping others. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a text in Yeshiyahu or Isaiah where he talks about the fast of what a real fast is. And a real fast is giving to those that are in need, what they need, and uh, you giving something up from yourself. That's what a real fast is. It's taking something that you have plenty of and, and you giving that up and giving it to someone who needs that desperately. 
that they don't have any way of having it. Uh, I think about these poor people that are in some of these countries that, and they're laying in the streets starving to death. Mm. When we have a, a plenty, a, a lot of food here. Of course, there is a, a famine that's coming. The uh, the uh, what we call the uh, well, they call themselves this, but we know they are there. They're uh, the super class. The super class are elitists that run the world, and they feel like they're. Imp it's been put upon them to manage all the resources of the world. And they're going to have to exterminate 90 to 95 percent of the population by means of wars, famines, famine is going to be the biggest one probably, and diseases. And uh, they're going to do this and implement this. In fact, they started to make plans of this as far back as into, in, in the 1960s, but they started to implement some of their plans in the 80s, like, you know, 30 years ago. <clears throat> so uh, famine is going to be upon us. And, you know, when you read about the <clears throat> the riders of the apocalypse, sometimes the four horsemen, uh, the angels of death, well, the uh, things that they're going to be implementing, uh, I think in this generation, we're going to see more and more of it. And uh, food is going to become scarce because of other weather related situations that Yahuwah, Yahushua warned us of through the prophets and of course uh, most of the revelation and Matthew chapter 24 Yahushua talked about the famine that was going to come and of course uh, stockpiling food is problematic because a lot of Nazarim are saying, yeah, I've already started stockpiling, stockpiling food. And I think that it's a, a good thing to do a little of that. Of course, to think that, you know, that's going to be the thing that saves you, though, is the problem. Because he, he will feed you, you know, if you're in dire, dire need. Because if the famine that he's imposing on the earth is there, then it's not for us to be receiving that plague. We would be the focus of that. It would be others. But anyway, when I talked about the superclass, their uh, plans are to reduce the population of the Earth substantially, so that not only they can manage with their, uh, you know, iron fist, but uh, the Charter of the United Nations doesn't give anybody any rights; it gives them power. And of course, uh, people that have talked to the United Nations, like our former presidents and things, and and our current president. They're, uh, they're all tickled about the United Nations becoming more powerful, you know, because that's the global government. And I'm just, uh, you know, seeing that as an evil force, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. The sovereignty of our nations are going to be at risk. And the ten sectors are going to be kingdoms. And uh, I think that's part of the prophecy, too, of, you know, Revelation and Daniel, the ten kingdoms uh, and the uh, ten horns. Yeah. Uh, so the sectors are there. We have a very interesting study on that in the, what is it, the fourth beast yeah. video? The fourth beast video? The fourth beast is a very interesting video because it does uh, portray reality, you know, yeah. and the plans of the super class. Well, the super class is uh, you know, the heads of, uh, well, we, we know what, who they really are. They're, uh, you know, the infiltrating octopus of the, the Vatican uh, Jesuit. They have many names, but the Illuminati, the Bilderbergers, and the, uh, of course, the uh, industrialists, you know. Um, you know, all the United Nations is actually a, a huge octopus. The United Nations has what they call the World Bank. And then from the World Bank, they have these divisions called the Federal Reserve Systems. And all the Federal Reserve Systems of all the countries all around the world. And they can just vacuum up the money and just cause this severe problem and joblessness. That's what we're seeing now. They're actually, they've taken all the money out of circulation. And they're saying, we've got inflation. And it's not inflation, it's the opposite, you know. But they're saying the wrong. I mean, they're blaming other people, and of course, a lot of people blame the Jewish bankers, and it's just, uh, it's just nonsense. But uh, 
you know, and all of you've probably heard about all the things that have been happening over the last week or so here in this country about the zombies that are marching in the streets. No, I haven't heard that one. Oh, yeah, it's like all over the news here. It started out in New York City where uh, these uh, left wing young people were marching by the hundreds and blocking bridges and for like all hours and hours and hours. And uh, they were basically complaining about a, a few things, but one of the main things is the rich bankers and Wall Street and so forth and all the rich people. And uh, anyway, they, uh, they're probably people that don't have jobs or pay taxes anyway, but they have plenty of time on their hands. In fact, they're probably living off the government a lot of them. But, uh, and, you know, if you're in need, I think that's okay. But anyway, they did that. And then, and then they're starting to clone these things, and they're all over the United States now. There were like four different cities that they did this in uh, a few days ago. And now it's starting to fragment out into other cities. So mm -hmm. it's just people complaining, you know. My uh, director is over here telling me that I'm already over one hour, so I've got to... Uh, <laughs> Well, we were out. We've just had daylight savings last weekend, so uh, we're now uh, instead of it being eleven o'clock, it's now midnight. And my director went to bed hours ago. Oh, they did change the time for you. Yeah. Next week is going to be the uh, first day of Sukkot. First day of Sukkot. Fantastic. Wow! Isn't yeah. that amazing? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, next week. <laughs> I'll see you next week then. Yeah. Love you, brother. Love you. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye-bye now. Toy Talk. Toy Talk. I said later.